Jesus' faith and me, uh, part eight of this particular series, talking about Jesus' faith and me. So important that we understand the role that Jesus plays in our life, uh, the role of faith in our life as a child of God. And if you are here this morning and you're not a child of God, it's so important that you understand what faith is and how that relates to you becoming a child of God and becoming a true worshiper in spirit and in truth to the great God of heaven. God is a good God and he is worthy of our praise. So we pray that you will listen attentively this morning uh, to see what meekness, uh, as uh, Paul says, God's engrafted word he is able to save our souls. This morning in Luke chapter 8, verse 22 through 25, which was read in your hearing, we see what Jesus had claimed. It says, came to pass on a certain day he was in a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake. And they were filled with water and were in jeopardy, or in peril. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? Where is your faith? And they being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man is this? For he commanded even the winds and water, and they obey him. And taking and launching from this particular text here, we have launched out and we have sought out and seen uh, and learned the importance of faith. As we have studied these lessons, Jesus, faith, and me, we have looked at the importance of faith. The Bible teaches us that without faith, we cannot please God. You must remember that without faith, you cannot please God. If there's ever anyone in your life that you have set out to please, it ought to be God. Amen. Because he says, Paul says, if I seek to please men, I'm no longer a servant of God. So you cannot run through your entire life trying to seek and please men. You must set out to please God. And if you do what's right according to God's word, listen, people are going to be pleased with you, or they're not. Amen? Amen. It does not have a burn on whether or not you make it to heaven, but you must please God. I can go to heaven without pleasing everybody around me. Amen. But I must please God. It is a necessity. Amen. So we learn uh, the importance of faith. All right. And then we learn what is faith. And we understand that Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 talks about faith being the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But let's look at it from this point. Faith is a firm belief that what God says in his word is true and it will happen. That's what faith is. If God said it, it's going to happen. Amen. Jesus says, let us get into the ship and cross over to the other side. Well, if you have true faith in what Jesus said, unlike his disciples at that particular time, you are already thinking about what you're going to do on the other side. Amen. Amen. Because he has said, let us launch over to the other side. That's right. It's already happened. Amen. Mm -hmm. If you believe in God. Amen. So it's a firm conviction that what he says is true. And then we must surrender ourselves to that belief. And when I surrender myself to that belief, then my actions change to show that my faith is in God. Amen. I can't say I have faith in God and continue to live in no, in no raggedy, scandalous life. Amen. Amen. I can't say I have faith in God and continue to carry on and, and hating people and holding grudges and cussing and acting a fool and fighting and all this. I can't do that. Amen. My actions have to change. Amen. So we looked at what is faith. How important is faith? Then we talk about what is faith. And we understand that the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. So we understand what faith is, how important it is, what it is, that we must live by faith. And if I live by faith, that means that every decision that I make is based on my faith 
in God to just to live by faith. And then as I live by faith, I have to walk differently. I can't walk two steps forward and one step back because I'm unsure. I have to have faith in God that the path he has set me on is the right path. So my walk changes. Amen. I have a new walk because now I'm not walking by sight, but I'm walking by faith. Amen. As Abraham, when God told him to get up and go, Abraham walked by faith. Amen. And then we talked about examples of faith. And we went back to Abraham, how God had told him he would have a son, and through his seed all nations would be blessed. But then God called on Abraham. God tested his faith. He said, okay, Abraham, I see you know how to walk by faith, but now let me test your faith. Uh -huh. So he said, you take your son, your only son, you take him up to the top of the mountain, and you offer him up as a sacrifice to me. Mm -hmm. So we saw an example of faith. And oh, by the way, Abraham performed well, Amen. He performed well. And then we talked about the impact that our faith can have on others and the impact that others' faith can have on me. My faith has a direct impact on everybody in here. Everybody that I meet, my faith in God has a direct impact on me, on them. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. <laughs> Sometimes, Sam, we run up on people that we want to stomp on. Amen. Amen. Sister Martin, I don't stomp because of my faith in God. I know I can't get to heaven stomping on people, amen. amen. So my faith in God has a direct impact on everybody that I run into and also everybody that you run into. Your faith has direct impact on them. And the faith of others have an impact on us because sometimes eh, people walk up on us and stomp us. That's right. That's right. But have faith in God, you don't go around stomping on people, amen. Amen. You don't go around belittling people, putting them down, and tearing them down, and dragging them down, and doing those things if your faith in God is where it needs to be. So our faith in God has a direct impact yes. on folks around us. Amen. And folks Amen. around us, their faith has an impact <coughs> on us in a good way or a bad way. And then we talked about Noah for a little bit and how righteousness comes by faith. Noah was kind of righteous before God, but because of his faith, he told him to build that ark, and he got to build it. That's right. And by his building the ark, he condemned all of mankind. But his faith was by righteousness because he did what was right, and only when you have faith in God will you do what is right. Now, I know people do good things, amen. amen. People do honorable things. People do charitable things. But until we do what is righteous, we cannot please God. Amen. And if my faith in God is fully where it needs to be, then I will live a righteous life and I would be a righteous person because God, his way is righteous. It's the right way. So Noah built that ark. And then we talked about coming home by faith. You know, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to leave home, but Abraham got up and left home by faith. When God told him to go, he got up and he walked. But then sometimes we have to go home, church. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we have to come back home. And sometimes it's hard to come back. Mm -hmm. But if your faith is where it needs to be, in God, then it's easy to come home. That's right. Remember how Jacob left home? His brother Esau said that when daddy died, I'm going to kill Jacob. They didn't give him a chance, did it? He left home. But there came a time when God said, Jacob, it's time for you to go back home. Right. Only through faith in God was Jacob able to make that return trip. Only through God. Amen. And some of us, we left home. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. We walked out on our loved ones. We left home. We walked out on God. It's time to come home. But only through faith in God that God is going to make everything okay when I have the nerve, the courage to step out and come back home. Mm -hmm. Only through faith in God. That's right. A strong, unwavering faith in God. And it doesn't matter how you left. Mm -hmm. Because right. you know, people going, I, I remember old oh, so and so, how they left here. Yeah. Yeah, come on. <laughs> it don't matter how you left God. Right. What matters is that you come back home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jacob. God told him it's time to go back home. By faith, he went back home. For just a few minutes this morning, I want to do some reading. I want to do some reading this morning. 
And I want to talk to you about Joseph in Genesis chapter 30, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 37. In Genesis chapter 37, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about Joseph. But I have to read this morning, and it's going to take more reading than I have talking to do. Amen. I'll just bring you back up to where we need to be. But in Genesis chapter 37, it says in verse 1, and Jacob dwelt. And this is just to familiarize with the story and, and to uh, remind some who have not read it in a while. And Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. It says, these are the generations of Jacob. And he starts talking about Joseph being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, and with the sons of Zippah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto him his father, and to his father their evil report. Now watch this, because you gotta, you gotta see what, what, what this star said. Now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his own age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Mm -hmm. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Sound like some of our families? Say amen. It's long we've lived, amen. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said to them, here, I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. Now, sometimes it's not always good to go out and tell you dreams, amen. But Joseph shared his dreams with his brothers, and you're going to see what happened with them. He said to them, here, I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. Now let me explain what this is. They're out here, they're binding the sheaves together, they're, they're gathering the harvest, they're binding the sheaves, and, and Joseph said, all of a sudden, his dream, he has stood up. And he said, oh, brothers, y'all stood up too. But then guess what happened? <coughs> y'all did the feasts, amen. Y'all bowed down to mine. That's right. mm -hmm. Now watch this. Now he already got this coat and they don't like him, amen. Because they say, think he's special. He got that coat that I gave him. Now he's telling them his dream. He said, your sheaves stood around about and made obeisance to my sheep. And his brother said to him, shall thou indeed reign over us? Or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him. They already hated him. Yet the more for his dreams and for his words. But Joseph didn't stop there. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Now you have to understand that Joseph had eleven brethren. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the sun and the moon and the stars and these eleven stars made obeisance. And then he go and tell his father and to his brother, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother, the sun and the moon, and thy brethren, the eleven stars, indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? Now dad is listening to this dream. And his brethren, not only did they hate him, but now they envied him. But his father observed the same. He said, let me think on this. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock, etc. And they went down there to feed their father's flock. And he sent Joseph to go down and check on his brethren. Let me fast forward here a little bit, amen. And in verse number 17, it says, And the man said, They are departed. He asked, Have they seen his brother? He said, When I heard, they said, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went out to his brethren and found him in Dothan. Now Joseph comes up on his brother. When they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. You've heard the saying, kill the dreamer, and you kill the dream. Kill the dreamer, and you kill the dream. This is the attitude, this is the mindset that these brothers have toward their own flesh and blood at this point. So you know this cannot turn out good. And Reuben, it says in verse 21, heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Hey, let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, 
that he might rid him out of, our, out of the hands to deliver him to his father. Now, Reuben's plan was to, hey, put him in the pit. We don't kill him. We put him in the pit. I'll come back later on and get him out of there. He boys and lost their mind. Mm -hmm. They talking crazy about killing him. Verse 23, and it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brother, they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And you notice when people start to turn you down, the first thing they're going to take away from you is what's important to you. They're going to strip it from you. And every day in life, someone is trying to strip your Christianity from you. They're trying to take what is most important to you from you, and when they take it from you and leave you there proud, and now they can bring you on down. And even try to put you in a pit. But watch this. His coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat with him. They lifted up their eyes and they looked and looked. And behold, a company of Israelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery, balm, myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brethren, What profit is it if we sway our brother and conceal his blood? Now he's thinking part way right, amen. Come and let us say him to the Israelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren, they were, they were okay, we can do that. Then they passed by many night merchantmen. But what they did, they sold him for 20 pieces of silver, and he was taken out of Egypt. Verse 29, now Reuben came back unto the pit, and behold, Job was not in the pit. He ran his clothes. And he returned to his brother and said, The child is not, and I will not, and I will shall I go. Now, Reuben, the oldest one here, he said, Where is this boy? Because you know, when you're older, you go somewhere with your younger siblings, amen. You let something happen to him. <laughs> you might not want to go home. So here's Reuben said, Oh, my goodness, where is this child? He says, And they took Joseph's coat, killed the king of ghosts, dipped the coat in the they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This we have found, no lie whether it be thy son's coat or no. They didn't tell him anything crazy. They just dipped the coat in blood, took it to the father, and his mind started to wonder. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. And the evil beast had to buy them. Joseph was without doubt in pieces. His father rent his clothes, put sackcloth upon his bones, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. Look at this. But he refused to be comforted and said, If I will go down into the grave until my son mourning, thus his father wept for him. And in the meantime, the many nights sold him in Egypt unto Potiphar and also Pharaoh and captain of the guard. That's what happened to Joseph. And now, as I close here, the rest of the story. <laughs> in Genesis chapter uh, 39, Genesis 39, starting in verse 1, we are briefly here, it says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, and also Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down there. Now he had changed hands twice. And the Lord was with him. Now watch this, because this is what we got to see. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper. Joseph is in a bad situation that's been sold twice. Now he is a common servant, sold at the hands of his own brethren, but notice, the Lord was with him, and he prospered. Amen. His master saw that the Lord was with him. Everything he touched, everything in his hands, he prospered. And Joseph found, watch this, grace in the sight of his master. And he served him. And he made an overseer over his house, and all that he had, he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he made an overseer in his house, everything this man had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Mm -hmm. The blessing of the Lord was upon all he had in the house and in the field, and he left all he had in Joseph's hand. Mm -hmm. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Listen, as a child of God, don't you ever forget that God is watching over you. We right. sing that song all day and all night. God watches over his. Right. Nothing happens in your life that God is not aware of. Sometimes we seem to forget that. 
what has happened to me. Sometimes we even go so much as to think in our mind, or maybe even say it out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? But as a child of God, let me assure you this morning, reassure you this morning, that God is always watching over you. Amen. So Joseph prospered. And then you drop down to verse 20 real quick. Genesis 39, verse 20 says, And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison. Oh, things have changed here now. He done went from everything he touched, prospering, and his master prospering. Now he's being cast into prison. What has changed? Well, I'm just telling this story, so don't y'all start throwing stuff up here. A woman came into the picture. Amen. The master's wife started to look at that Joseph. Well, well. <laughs> she started having eyes and, and desires for Joseph, and she went after Joseph in a physical way, but Joseph ran off and left his coat. That's right. He was getting out of the vicinity. But now she is a woman scorned. I'm not making this up. It's in the Bible. Brother Kerry, tell him it's in there. It's in there. Now she's a woman scorned, so she tells her husband, this little slave boy, this little servant boy came after me. And the man had Joseph cast into prison. Now it's not looking so good for Joseph. But it says in verse 20, as we drop down here, it says, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prison was bound, and he was there in the prison. Now he is in prison after being a slave, been sold as a piece of property, been sold as a servant, now he goes into prison. But verse 21 says, but the Lord was with, listen, if you are a child of God, I don't care how your situation changes, financially, economically, health-wise, whatever the case may be, if you are a child of God, Amen. God is still with you, y'all. I don't know if you've been there or not, but there's been times where I've been feeling really low and feeling down in my life and recognizing, wait a minute, I'm a child of God. God is still with me. And I need to tell somebody. So here's Joseph. He's in prison. But it says the law was with him and showed him mercy and gave him favor. Watch this. In the sight of the keeper of the prison. Listen, those who may believe they have you in prison in whatever sense, God will turn their favor on you, towards you. That's how God works. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I was applying for a, a job. And it was very important that I, I got this job because it would bring me back home to Fort Smith and I would be able to uh, fulfill my uh, military obligation and still work towards my retirement. And I applied for a position and, and it had to go through a person that really, really despised me, and I really, really prayed for them, amen. I didn't like my whole life, but I learned that my soul was more important than me not liking him, amen. But that position had to come across his desk, and I was concerned about it. I was even worried about it, and I'm like, this is not going to work out. But then I prayed about it, and said, you know what? I'm a child of God. And God is in control. And this person gave me the most favorable review. I don't know if he was punishing me or not when he did it. In his mind, maybe he was. Amen. But I got the position. See, God will use people for our advantage. Mm -hmm. God will turn the mind and the thinking of somebody to use them for the advantage of his children. That's the God we serve. So here's Joseph. God showed him mercy. And he found favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prison. Now Joseph is in charge of all the prisoners that were in the prison. This is the same Joseph who is being threatened by his brothers to be killed. They put him in a pit, isolated him now. Come on now, I know somebody has been there. Ain't nobody no physical jail necessarily. And I know some of y'all have been in there too. Don't step back like you have it. 